So we've talked about what you've been doing at KKR, sort of the principles of how it works. How specifically has it applied in this specific instance? So what we do each time, and what we've done in the case of Charter Next Gen, is we lay the foundation of a different type of culture, which is ownership. So we made every employee at Charter Next Gen a stockholder in the company. It's important to note it was a free and incremental benefit, so we're not asking workers to invest out of pocket. We're not asking people to trade off wages for stock. So it doesn't come out of their paycheck? It does not come out of their paycheck. It's a free incremental benefit. It's also important to note it's a meaningful amount of stock. So we are hoping at Charter Next Gen, now this is equity, it's risk, it's not a guarantee, but if we hit our plan, that we can show people a path to earning 100% of their income in stock. Now that, that's just the foundation. Really the purpose of it is to change the culture, to get people more engaged on the job, to get people to think like business owners, and over time, get the quit rate down and the engagement scores up. And in the short time we've been working together with Charter Next Gen, the quit rates are down 33%, the number of engaged employees up 23%, safety's improved. So even in the two years we've been at this, we're starting to make real progress. So Kathy, take it from your side of it. Yes. Uh, uh, Charter Next Gen, as I understand it, is a, a leading producer of film used in packaging. A lot yes. of things that we buy when we go to the supermarket has some of your film around it. Uh, you were a successful company before Pete came along. It's not like you were struggling, about to go belly up. What did you see in this opportunity that otherwise you might not have seen from somebody else? Well, first of all, this, this is a dream for me to be able to offer equity ownership to every employee. I look at it, every single employee is part of the success of the company. It's a team sport. So it doesn't make sense that you would only reward the top executives, the top 5% with equity. So the opportunity to give equity to everyone aligns the incentives. So now everyone has the same incentive, which is to create value for the long term. You know, when you give an employee who's living on an hourly wage the opportunity to build that nest egg, that's life changing. And that's our goal here, is, is to really have an amazing outcome and give them that nest egg. Pensions have largely uh, gone away, so there's no opportunity to get ahead. I think about the cash compensation, that's what you use to pay your bills. The equity is what you use to create wealth. And if you don't have an opportunity for equity, how are you going to create wealth? You mentioned you have some encouraging returns so far. How far can this go? I mean, I, you must believe in it because I think you've got a documentary in the process, right, that you're working on with Kathy. We've released two clips so far of the uh, documentary film, and no pressure, but th this has to be a big win now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm fully committed. I, I am going to do my best, and I know our people will too. This has created such an esprit de corps in the company, and, you know, the what I think is really important as a leader is to take the people metrics as seriously as you take the business metrics. So much of the time, we focus on profit, focus on sales, focus on things we can measure. But you know, for us, it's really about focusing on engagement. Think about the fact that in the US, 40%, 40 to 50% of manufacturing companies face a turnover issue. That's how many people quit. 40 to 50% of employees quit their jobs every year. Think about if you can reduce that down to 5%, the value that you can unlock. So that's where we're focused now. We also want to give our employees a voice. So we've implemented things like employee-directed capital. We give each plant a budget. You decide how this capital is going to be spent. You have to vote on it. You have to agree. But then imagine spending this money to improve your break room making an outdoor eating area. When you give the worker the decision around their work, that helps to create engagement. We also let them decide what charitable organizations we want to sponsor in their community. Again, they vote on it, and they decide what impact they want to have in the community with our charitable contributions. Pete, one of the things that's happened since you and I last spoke, actually, is a fair amount of uh, organized labor activity. As we have a strike right now with the Writers Guild and SAG after, who knows what's going to happen with UAW. It doesn't look real good right now. But as I listen to what Kathy's saying right now, that's a world away from talking about hundreds of work rules to say exactly who goes where, uh, what. Do these two things fit together? Does employee ownership fit with organized labor? I think it can. I think historically, Organized labor took a skeptical eye, understandably, to ownership. You know, because to a union, the employees are their members, not your, empl not your employees, mm -hmm. right? So 
when you start then aligning their members with your company, that can be a conflict. I think that's changing. I think there's a real openness to, to new models uh, and aligning capital uh, in labor. And as you note, we've gone from a, a period of time where, yeah, you saw some strife in autos and manufacturing, but now you're seeing it everywhere. Um, and people, they want to be a part of something. They want shared gains. Um, they, want to, they want transparency around how we're going to manage through all of this change driven by technology, AI, you know, in the case of, of the, the writer's strike, transitions to EVs in the case of UAW, there's a lot of complicated questions we're going to have to answer, and I think we're going to all do a lot better if we're in the boat together. Uh, so, Mary, finally to you, yeah. uh, we don't know how this will end up. I guess we'll have to mm -hmm. wait for the documentary to find out what ends <laughs> yes. up. But, and I know you can't predict what's happening, but how big a difference could this make in some of your employees' lives? You mentioned before, mm -hmm. you get a paycheck to pay yeah. the bills, but, yeah. but it's very hard to amass capital, mm -hmm. to amass wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, how good could this be for some of your employees, do you think, or hope? Life-changing. I mean, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, 40 percent of Americans have less than $400. They're one car repair bill, one medical emergency, away from financial devastation. Think about building a nest egg of $50,000, $100,000. There are employees who have said, this will end generational poverty in my family. And I mean, that's inspiring to me. That, you know, yes, I have been a private equity sponsored CEO for 13 years now, I've sold the company before. This one to me is the most special. This is the one that I know I'm going to work the hardest on and I know my team is going to work the hardest on. And it's really about breaking down that wall between the plant and the office. When you talk about union, that's it. We normalize that. We normalize the fact that management and labor don't get along. I want to flip the script on that. And we're going to have to fix this. So in manufacturing, we've now got 600,000 open jobs. National Association of Manufacturers says we're going to be short 2 million workers by 2030. When you talk to manufacturing CEOs and you say, what's your biggest concern? It's not supply chain. It's not state of the economy. And my number one concern CEOs in manufacturing say is I can't attract and retain people. So it's, going, it's great at the company level. We're going to have to do this or something like this at the, at the kind of economy level if we're going to continue to be successful.